Stay hungry, stay foolish. Before we launch into part two of The Signs of Hate with Matt Williams, I want to thank our sponsor Zai, boldly transforming the future of financial services with a suite of embedded products and services enabling businesses to manage multiple payment workflows and move funds with ease. Check out Zai at hellozai.com. It's great to welcome back the author of The Science of Hate, Professor Matthew Williams. Welcome back, sir. Awesome to be back. It's great to have you back. I was joking with you before we came on air. I have a quote that I was going to start off with, and it's by a certain president. And I can't say the name because it's going to affect the algorithm. And we're like, well, that's actually part of the problem that we're going to be talking about today is the rise of the bots the problem with algorithms, filter bubbles, echo chambers, and how they have a massive impact on our ideas of prejudice and our information sourcing or not, as the case may be. But this quote was by this president in a country that's at war. And he said, whoever becomes the leader in artificial intelligence will become the ruler of the world. And I thought how apt, because it has such an impact on how people are incited. It's a huge accelerant towards hate that you talk about in the book. And I thought, you know, I, I did a little experiment myself. And I said to people, Oh, you're being manipulated by algorithms all the time. And even I think it myself, and I go, No, no, I'm in control. And actually, that's the problem, we think we're in control. And much of the work that you do in hate lab shows us how we're not how little we're in control of the information, how what we search for has a dramatic impact on what we see. And then that creates a worldview. If you're started off on the internet as tabula rasa, you're certainly not tabula rasa by the end of the day, because so much of the internet is controlled by bots and artificial intelligence. So I thought we'd start off as you do in the book, on this chapter about Eliza Tay, and then the 50 cent army, which is probably the most interesting aspect of all this. It's a really good demonstration, I think, of how uh, um, the internet is different in different parts of the world and how that has an, an impact and an effect on how algorith algorithms learn and then uh, uh, feedback information to us in these crazy feedback loops that we're, that we're always a part of, even though we might not realize it. Um, so... Uh, one of the very first attempts at sort of artificial intelligence, or, or one might say one of the best tests of artificial intelligence is the chatbot. The notion that um, if you can build a chatbot that is uh, convincing enough to trick you into thinking it's a human, that the Turing test we're talking about here now, then we've created the true form of AI. Um, now, the Turing test obviously ha is... is uh, controversial. It's it's an interesting test to identify whether or not uh, a form of artificial intelligence might become self aware, or if it can convince other humans that it is in it is itself human. Um, and one of the very first attempts at this was Eliza, which is this just simple chatbot that uh, was developed, I think in the 70s. And all it did actually was this feedback, uh, the same kinds of information to the to the, the human speaker. So a human speaker would say a sentence, um, and it would more or less repeat that sentence back to them, maybe with an inflection in the voice or phrase it into a question. So it wasn't very sophisticated. It didn't convince anyone that it was another human. Um, but it became kind of the barometer of, of what is, uh, um, the, the, what is artificial intelligence or what scale it needs to be at to, to pass that Turing test, if you like. And Microsoft, uh, recently actually had another go at creating a chatbot called Tay. T A Y. Um, uh, obviously, Microsoft have research divisions all over the world, uh, in the US, in the UK, and in China and elsewhere. And uh, this this was a US based research outfit that decided to to create Tay um, and launch it on Twitter. Where better to launch a chatbot than on Twitter? Eh? Uh, and it was a test of their intelligence. It was a test of their AI intelligence and a, a test of a, a demonstration of how far that, that Microsoft had, had come in terms of developing these kinds of technologies. And, you know, rather benignly, Tay started off by saying something along the lines of, hello world, I think was the first tweet that it posted. And people started to interact with it, um, curious as to how good this this AI was. And Tay seemed pretty advanced. Uh, it was coming back with some really quite interesting 
um, speech formulations. You know, it was able to interact with with whatever people were throwing at it in a pretty convincing way. Um, but within 24 hours, within 24 hours, it had been radicalized and it started to spew out racist, homophobic, transphobic bile overnight. And it was quickly taken down by its creators within that, within, within, you know, minutes of, of it, of it actually posting this stuff. And everyone started to ask questions, you know, why did this piece of software do this? Why, why, why did this happen? You know, it's artificial intelligence. And, and then you start to dig a bit deeper into how it was created. Uh, apparently it was fed a lot of information uh, on the internet to train its language model. So it was fed lots of speech um, from various social media sources to so it could emulate human speech. So it looked at what was on the internet already and then trained its language model in an attempt to be a more effective communicator with a human. And of course, the, the content it was exposed to uh, was vast, but also contained a lot of hate speech. And therefore, it learnt hate speech and started to spout that hate speech out. Now, that's, to me, not that surprising. What's really interesting, and this is what I write about in the book, is that Microsoft, around the same time, also created a Chinese version of Tay that fed off uh, uh, information on the Chinese internet, which is a very different kind of internet to the, the internet the rest of the world see. This is primarily because it's a heavily regulated internet. And you mentioned the 50 Cent Army. The Chinese government employ tens of thousands of people located in vast warehouses in different parts of, of, of China to monitor everything that gets posted on the Chinese internet. So anything that might be critical of the government or the status quo is either removed or there is a lot of kind of counter messaging um, that that tries to bring the population around to the most common way of uh, the preferred way of thinking and posting. So the Chinese internet isn't really full of that much hate speech. It's certainly not full of much hate speech targeting the government. And it's a very different looking internet. Now, why that is interesting is because the chatbot that Microsoft created in China didn't engage in any hate speech whatsoever, because the language model it learned from, the Chinese internet was devoid of all that controversial stuff because of that heavy censorship. Now, I'm not promoting a heavily censored internet. I'm just using this as an example uh, of a natural experiment where you, you train one chatbot in the Western world uh, based on sort of American social media, and you train one in China based on a very set heavily censored internet, and it behaves very differently. And what this says is that the stuff that's on the internet, the content that's on the internet, on social media, on websites, etc., is incredibly biased, and it reflects back to us those biases on a routine basis, either via chatbots or algorithms of other of another nature. Um, there's a really interesting study that looked to implement something called the implicit association test on the internet. So the IAT is is, is a relatively straightforward test to try and tap into our implicit prejudices. It, it, it's designed in the following way. It shows you images of black and white faces very flashing very quickly on a screen. And then in a quick association with that, it shows you a mix of um, good and bad words. Uh, and it, it tests your ability to associate good and bad words with black and white faces based on your keystroke of a keyboard. So it's so quick that you're not able to think very, uh, uh, um, uh, very clearly about what you're doing. It's more of an instinctive reaction. And, and basically the argument is if you, if you are biased towards black faces or white faces, you're more likely, for example, to associate bad words with black faces and good words with white faces. It's come under criticism that, you know, it's it's not heavily predictive of behavior in the real world, but the results are, are interesting. Now, what one uh, um, academic decided to do was to see if he could actually sort of clone this experiment for the Internet itself. And how they did that was that they looked for the mention of white sounding names versus the, 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 um, the use of black sounding names. And then looked around those names in the same document to see what kinds of other words were proximate to it. And what it found was white 
names were far more likely to be cited by positive words versus black names that were far more likely to be cited by negative words. And that just shows you how biased the content on the internet actually is. And all it's doing, of course, is reflecting what we've put on it. We put this stuff on there. You know, human beings populated the internet with the information that sits on there. So all it's doing is reflecting back at us the prejudices that we have as individuals and as institutions. But the problem starts to get really scary when algorithms get involved and they are being trained to interact with humans and to make decisions based on the information that we put up there that's deeply, deeply prejudiced. Some of your own findings from your own lab are really interesting. I thought perhaps we'd share, for example, you mentioned Google, Google autocomplete. So when you're searching and the autocomplete and what it suggests, what what's the words you're looking for here? And when you put in race, or you put in religion, for example, it can suggest certain things. And I, I thought it was so interesting that, for example, in part one, we were talking about some of the harrowing cases that you mentioned in the book. And that, that unfortunately, just as it does in innovation, for, for example, one of the things we say in innovation is, it's often the case that an organization waits till the crisis has happened to make the changes that should have been made anyway. So it's easier sometimes for a leader of an organization to save the organization after it's hit the iceberg, because then they become this big savior versus, well, maybe those decisions I made way back, we is why we never hit an iceberg in the first place. Nobody celebrates that, you know, nobody celebrates the prevention, it's always the, you know, the savior after the case, etc. And you talk about these pivotal cases that often happen, that are trigger events to, to make, you know, to, for criminalization of certain acts, etc. And, and that's a huge point. But then, that also happens on the internet. We also wait until there's some type of terrible case in order to make actions, to make cases, to make change that's so necessary. And I say all that to say, you talk about this, that even though the big tech giants have been warned to make the changes, they often don't make the changes until there's a threat of a big fine. So you see this, for example, in Germany, with certain certain regulations versus the UK, for example. Uh, you started off with that example of Google and my my bit of research and just to typing in search terms. And it was quite surprising and actually changed during the writing of my book, they changed the algorithm during the writing of my book, because they'd been called up by you know, governments uh, in the UK and elsewhere for for allowing their AI to run amok and um, uh, make pretty racist, homophobic suggestions as, as search terms. So, you know, I typed in, for example, queers are in the algorithm, and and one of the suggestions to autocomplete the search was are an abomination. You know, so you know it's pretty offensive to to see that reflected back at you as a valid search query. And Google, uh, to their defence. Uh, if I were to ever defend them, <laughs> said that you know it's that's based on what people are searching for. All we're doing is showing you what lo what most people search for when they search for the term queers. And I'm like, well, I don't want that shoved back in my face. Thank you very much. I know that there are lots of people that are prejudiced using search engines and Twitter and Facebook, etc. But you're perpetuating it by suggesting it's a valid search term. You know and you 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 do it now. Yeah? Any of your listeners can go onto Google now and type in, say, "blacks are Jews are," and and it won't give you many suggestions. In fact, I think if you type in "blacks are," there are no suggestions at all because they switched the suggestion off for that particular search because it always came up with racist uh, uh, content um, based on what people are searching for, which is incredibly incredibly depressing. Um, you know, they did change the algorithms once it was brought to their attention. Um, they uh, had a similar problem with their, their translate function. So, for example, if you were translating uh, from one language to another that, say, uh, um, didn't have uh, gender pronouns uh, in the same way that, say, English does, say, for Finnish, for example, um, it would always associate, uh, say, for example, certain roles as either male or female in the English translation, even though in the native there was neither male or female associated with it. So, for example, if you were to type in um, uh, 
uh, uh, they are a doctor, it would might come back with uh, he is a doctor versus uh, they are a, a nurse would come back with she is a nurse, uh, for example. I mean, less less problematic, some might think, but it's still perpetuating these sort of gender norms, which are are problematic, and you wouldn't want to teach your kids that. But again, it's just another example of how these algorithms that are perceived as relatively benign are allowed to run without uh, any significant oversight um, f- until a government or an organization flags it with them, and then they may or may not change the algorithm. So Google did respond to that. They also responded with YouTube and their and the algorithm that tended to promote more extreme content um, over less extreme content uh, because it kept people on the platform for longer. Um, but it did take a lot of pressure. And you're right. Can we get these big social media companies to change change their behavior? The problem for me is that the algorithms that are most dangerous, and these are the engagement algorithms that keep you on the platform for longer, once they turned them on and they started seeing those dollars roll in like never before, it's going to be it's going to take a lot to get them turned off and to see those profits tumble and them accept that as 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 a consequence um, of of their actions. Basically, these algorithms work out what keeps us glued to to our screens. Unfortunately, because of various aspects of various aspects of human nature and evolution, we're very often glued to more negative stuff than positive stuff. It goes back to the amygdala and the and the brain stuff. Um, Basically, you know, we're constantly on the lookout for threats because, you know, as a species, we are experts at survival. Um, and we always will seek out bad news over good news because you want to be aware of our threat environment. What's the threat landscape look like? So we're always attached to more extreme negative news than we are positive news. Not to say that those videos and images of cats, kittens and dogs don't keep us glued. They do the same kind of thing. For a very different reason but the more extreme that's why you see them so much because they're also being promoted by the algorithms but conversely we're also getting the really bad and, and really extreme stuff and because the algorithms learn that that keeps us on for a few seconds longer uh, which means that we can be advertised to for a few seconds longer they just sort of perpetuate that that um that process and you know i think at one point jack dorsey before he left twitter was 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 became sort of deeply aware of the consequences of the of the engagement algorithm when they take when they change their timeline algorithm um and there was some talk of him even potentially suggesting that twitter turn it off uh but he left twitter before he could he could he could actually see that through and even if he would have done it in the end we don't know but ultimately you know it still works it still operates and all the big social media giants are doing it it's the same with TikTok right now um I find that platform incredibly sticky I cannot stop looking at it and it drives me nuts and they've figured out a new way of keeping us engaged and that's not to keep us engaged based on uh, people who we follow as such, but more to do with interests that we have. And and they literally, um, you know, are able to monitor how many milliseconds you're engaging with a piece of content. And it deeply shapes what you see next. I remember actually creating another account away from mine just to test the algorithm. And I, for example, started to look at a lot of um, a conspiracy theory and misinformation posts about vaccine, uh, um, about the COVID-19 vaccine and other things. And, you know, I just watch one full video on sort of uh, conspiracy theory about the vaccine. And um, that's all I got. I, I may have had a couple of videos that were not related to it, but everything else I got was about sort of, uh, um, sort of anti-vax and, and and other conspiracy theories associated with it and it was just so shocking that i i actually couldn't get out of that spiral i was stuck in it so i had to delete the account i actually told tiktok tiktok this i advised tiktok on some of their hate policy stuff and i actually said to the the guys in the uh in the team who said you know i did this and i got stuck in this loop and i had to delete my account and they were looked at me and they were somewhat sort of taken aback by the fact that i'd done that and they were kind of like okay thanks for telling us about that you know and they weren't surprised, but they were surprised that I did it. I think, and uh, it just it just shows you how these algorithms operate, uh, and it's all about that kind of business model that that they have. So, you know, I don't not sure how 
how influential governments are going to be at convincing these massive corporations to change their change their models because you know no amount of fine can can change that kind of model i mean if they change the model they'd probably be they'd lose more money than any fine could actually uh, impose on on a company so we're in a sad set of affairs and i think we're going to need um a sort of a massive sea change in that in that so the culture of that industry i think uh, to see anything anything major uh, happen you were saying about tiktok and one thing does really concern me which is like the long form content that I publish on this show is, I mean, you know, you, you've written the book, we will have done probably two and a half hours, I'd say by the time we finish, maybe more. And like that takes time to read the book. But then it still doesn't give a holistic picture of the book, like we'll only get through probably, probably in depth, maybe three or four chapters, if even. And then I constantly I've released a new part of the show called Innovation Bites, B-Y-T-E-S. And the whole concept of that as well, I get so many people saying they prefer shorter form content. And I kind of go, yeah, I know. <laughs> but it feels wrong to do that because you can only see it from you, you only get a, a slice of the perspective when you get that short bite, I mean, you can chop a bite anyway, which way you want to sound or confirm whatever biases you have in the first place. And I thought I'd say that because that that is very much on my mind all the time. But then when you talked about, for example, algotransparency.org, which is a website former Google employee went and created, and you talk about what happened to you, what happens to a lot of people. So we saw a spike in because of fearful the climate, the accelerance of of hate, as you talk about, but also the accelerance of conspiracy theories as well, was during the pandemic, we saw a huge spike in conspiracy theories, both both about the pandemic itself, but about lots of different things. And, you know, the dots connect, <laughs> and in crazy ways, uh, for many, many people. And what happens to them is then they go down into their content platform, and they get stuck down a rabbit hole somewhere. And then they think that's reality. And then on top of that, if you add in, like you talk about, and perhaps you'll elaborate on this, if you talk about, well, if stuff's tweeted, for example, and then you have bots in places like Russia or Afghanistan, retweeting, that shows validation of those tweets. Oh, what the heck? That's got a 1000 retweets? Oh, my God, it must be real. That's really, really dangerous. Yeah, and I think it's important to emphasize that the the role of bots are you know multifaceted in the sense that some of them can be driven purely by sort of code or a form of AI, but more often than not, bots are controlled by individuals and organizations. They're kind of fake accounts that have automated elements to them, but they have an agenda, um, and that agenda may favor a state in in one way or another and we've seen that happen quite a lot with trigger events and the re online reaction to trigger events uh, and where disinformation and dis uh, uh, misinformation as well is perpetrated uh perpetuated uh by by an army of bots and the internet research agency in russia for example has been implicated in lots of different things including election election tampering um but also we found that bots associated with that organization also inflamed misinformation around terror attacks in the uk for example there was a an image for example of a a, a woman in a headscarf walking past the victim uh, following the london bridge terror attack and it, the image suggested that she was sort of quite blasé about the whole thing and was on her phone and walking away not even looking or caring about the victim uh, and that was that was amplified by uh, bots associated with the internet research agency in Russia it received you know tens of thousands of retweets and likes um, and it turned out that it was false information because another picture had been taken from another angle that clearly showed the woman was in distress and that she was completely aware of the situation and was clearly empathetic because she was tearful and you know that wasn't shared in anywhere near as much when the whole agenda there was let's sow division 
between groups in the United Kingdom at this very sensitive time in the wake of this terror attack, because any division is good for our country. If we can divide a country along uh, classic lines of, of division, one being race, another being religion, etc., then it weakens a country. The more, the more, uh, uh, I guess, cooperative and, and cohesive a country is, the stronger it is, the more divided it is, the weaker it is. And this is the kind of playbook of, of, of sort of the, 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 the Russian agencies in a sense. It's kind of what you see continuously, this kind of con continuous undermining of, of democracies and of states. And they're now using all technology at their disposal to achieve this. Um, and that was a really interesting and terrifying example of where those bots were heavily involved in sort of falsely promoting seemingly by individuals that had their own minds uh, a, a story that was was clearly was a clearly misrepresented one um and yet yeah, it's terrifying to see that happen um we've also you know in the book i talk about the horrendous case in in myanmar uh, and the and the rohingya genocide um and the the role that facebook had in had in that to think that a social media company would have a role in such a horrendous uh, a horrendous genocide is it seemed at one point to be sort of an unthinkable thing really but um you know even the un had come out in its report and said that facebook had a sort of deciding factor an incredibly influential factor in stirring up of hatred in in that country and the and the sort of mass killing of the rohingya minority um and facebook just put their hands up and said sorry yeah you're right we did. We released our technology in that country at a time when citizens in that country weren't very used to having mobile phones. It was too expensive to have mobile phones. And then overnight, tax laws were changed, which meant that um, mobile phones became affordable. And the first thing that the, the population downloaded were, was Facebook, because ultimately uh, uh, Facebook was the only platform, unlike other platforms at the time, that, that, that had a a, a option for their language so they were using it to to communicate with each other and you know it went from like no one using facebook to like 80 percent of the country using facebook in the space of you know a couple of years and it became the main form of communication and and but the authorities took great advantage of that and started to spread vile hateful disinformation about the minority and uh, there was no attempt to stop it. One of the main reasons Facebook said was, well, we had very few people who could speak the local language in our moderation teams, and it was really hard to get people to moderate. Um, and that was it. That was the sort of the limit of their of their excuse. And it just wasn't good enough. Um, their algorithms didn't work on the language, um, so they couldn't automatically detect false and misleading and hateful information they didn't have enough moderators speaking the local language to distinguish between what was true and false um and it was just let 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 to run wild um and it played a decisive factor in in that in that genocide um and it's amazing that so few people speak about it i mean I, it's becoming more well known as time goes by but the there was for me there was clearly not enough outrage at the the involvement of facebook in that case at that time and you know this is why i delve into it in the book because it, i think we all need to learn about that and the role it played because if it can play a role like that in one part of the country one part of the world i should say you know it can it can do the same in another the one thing they did come out and say was that you know we, we're, we're going to change policy so you know when we do sort of launch our technology in a developing country that's not very tech savvy you know that the population weren't very tech savvy um because they weren't giving any any tech for a long time we will put extra safeguards in place they didn't say what those would be and you know we're not entirely sure if they were implemented but yeah i mean it was such a shocking um shocking example of where social media has been implicated in the worst kind of the worst kind of uh sort of massacre and and the consequence seemed to be negligible for the company one of the things I was thinking about was how many, many people didn't take menopause that seriously as, as a really huge impact on, on society until Davina McCall got involved and you had this kind of spokesperson for it and then that ignited the change in some way. And 
I say that to say that we often wait till it's too late. We wait till there's a problem. We saw it in the floods in the States, for example. People knew there was problems with the walls. The flooding happens. Then it's like, oh, we'll fix it afterwards. What I love about what you do in Hate Lab is your tech can sniff out when things are, it's velocity, it's when things are starting to change, when there's an accelerant being put in place, you can spot it in real time versus what the police do. And this is for a lack of education and lack of tech and lack of holistic understanding that criminology does, is that you can see it from a wide range of angles while they only see it after the fact. So it's your predictive and their post analytical. It was, it came about because there was this kind of gap in in the market really it seemed like um there was lots of tech out there for monitoring things like brand uh, interactions awareness and reactions and so on but there was nothing out there that would allow ngos those with a remit to monitor hate speech those to hold the social media organizations to account to identify perpetrators and and so on and so forth um w- with a tech that could identify sort of different forms of problematic speech. Um, hate speech for, uh, is probably the common term for it. Um, and, you know, because the market wasn't there, it was left to scientists and NGOs to kind of come up with the tech. And, and we were lucky enough to get some seed funding to build the tech and then then offer it to uh, these organizations that, that do a fantastic job of, of, of monitoring the sort of the pulse of the nation or the pulse of certain areas on social media in real time that allows us then to identify when say uh, there are rising tensions in an area uh, around a certain topic for example uh, very often before the authorities would would pick it up and it's it was an eye on the world that 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 we'd never had before um and the speed and the the volume of information was was unprecedented you know uh, um and we needed we needed new tech and a, a dedicated team to kind of to kind of harness this this new powerful form of data that gave us this kind of early warning system um if you like and yeah we're now in that position where we've built the tech and it's it's being used by um sort of all, all different types of organizations just to just sort of to monitor hate speech in in certain contexts uh, and the and the vision is to basically democratize this form of technology that itself uses ai very much like the social media companies but we've turned the ai on its on its head if you like instead of the ai promoting extremist attitudes um it now looks for extremist attitudes and then flags to us when they they go over a certain level and an alarm will go off and, and we can identify what's unfolding on the streets and uh, our vision is to sort of democratize that kind of technology amongst organizations that that try to sort of um to protect democracy to try to protect minority groups in in certain countries you know i would have loved to have had this tech in in myanmar when when all that was kicking off and facebook was being used to um to you know stoke that stoke that fire and the technology hopefully you know, i envisage it being able to pick up this this kind of unprecedented rise in hate speech and disinformation and and the vision is you know well once you know it's happening what can we do to stop it can we inject some counter narrative into that information flow can we actually you know get get folks on the uh, boots on the street and, and and try to try to address whatever problems unfolding there and that's the dream and i think you know we've got a long way to go before we can realize that because we're still at that stage where we've got this this minimal viable product that actually works quite well but you know we need we need to take it further so we can sort of democratize this technology amongst amongst uh, organizations that 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 sort of protect democracies around the world I thought we'd finish on a, on a, on solutions, and I pulled a quote that I absolutely love because, again, I I meant uh, you know I think throughout the book I I uh, it's very clear you're an optimist and that you're sharing this content in a consumable, accessible way to help people make more valid decisions, and I love this quote, and maybe it'll take us to maybe a finale of what we can do about it, what, you know, if we encounter hate speech ourselves, rather than just be passive about it, what we can do about it, etc. Because you say in the book that one of the encouraging aspects of what you found from 20 years of research, essentially, and then 
the concentrated effort of you and your team in hate lab is that one that it maintains your faith in the wisdom of the crowd and you say that counter hate speech always outweighs hate speech following trigger events in the uk for example following the brexit vote hate speech on twitter was dwarfed by those social media users who came to support who came to the support of the targeted victims which was really encouraging because it can be turned the tide can be turned the other aspects we talked about police education uh, building trust between police and witnesses and victims for example that they don't feel they can't come forth all this kind of stuff they're all it's a systemic issue so there's so many nodes of the network that needs to be solved or needs to be improved in order to make the entire network and the system better as a result but maybe you have a couple of final messages for us on an individual level of what we can do about it yeah i mean that that's the one thing that keeps me sane is is you know when we've got an eye on all the the vile extreme stuff on social media we can also see all the good stuff the the healthy conversations that that are unfolding and yeah i mean i have faith in humanity um you know just by looking at something like twitter and facebook because there's so much more positivity uh, uh on there than there is negativity i mean just to give you a rough a rough estimate you know when we when we see an event unfold only around one percent of the traffic sort of is, is hateful but of course you know you've got hundreds maybe thousands of victims in that one percent being targeted of course so you know, it, it's the scale of social media and the speed of social media that's that's causing this kind of this problem um and you know one percent of of a billion posts is a hell of a lot of posts and ultimately you know i don't want to dwarf the the size of the problem by by using percentages but you know 99 percent of those communications are then are then more neutral or positive in orientation and and very often if someone is being targeted you do see uh folks coming to their defense you know and put themselves sometimes in harm's way in in doing so using their counter speech and counter narratives to try and correct uh the speech of the perpetrator and, and it's it, that is heartwarming when you see that unfold and it, it, it's 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 a powerful thing and yeah the wisdom of the crowd the the um the ability and the power of people when they come together is is something to behold and and we see it on a daily basis on social media when 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 someone is attacked unfortunately you know we do get polarization on social media and the algorithms are partly responsible for that and communities form and um become even more polarized and you know counter speech is important in trying to depolarize and sometimes it's effective and sometimes it's not but i think my message to listeners would be if they do see count if they do see hate speech on social media not to just scroll on by you know do something about it you know report it to the platform if you don't want to engage if you if you do feel like you want to engage then do so but with appropriate safeguarding you know don't go in and, and use uh, hate speech yourself uh go in and try to reason with the person if if you can if you're not getting anywhere you know get out of that conversation then maybe report it to the platform uh, but if you do seem to get somewhere with with the person you're speaking to and they and they seem to be coming around continue that engagement and i think you know in in about 50 percent of cases you are going to get people responding um with with further questions about your position if you're using counter speech because a lot of the folks that go on social media to to say these things these hateful things are young people you know they are young impressionable people that are that are reachable with logic and kindness and education and i think we have to realize that they're not all the they're not these sort of mission haters that i talked about earlier they are they are impressionable young minds and i think we have to see them as that uh, at least assume that the person sending the hate speech is um is redeemable is a person that can change and i think if we do that um we, we kind of win half the battle and uh and this is what I see in constantly on on social media that you know that that, that those that are involved in it are young impressionable minds that can be changed, and with appropriate counter speech, um, they will they will stop engaging in that kind of hate speech. And I think that's uh, it's an important lesson that we've learned empirically in the lab.
Amen, brother. And Matt, for people who want to find you, reach out to you. I mentioned in the last episode that you have that tech you're looking for to spin out. Maybe somebody will know a company or be an investor themselves that might be interested. Where can they find you? Well, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, HateLab.net is is uh, the lab webpage. And uh, yeah, you can get in touch with us there and, and get up to date with all our latest uh, research. The author of The Science of Hate, How Prejudice Becomes Hate and What We Can Do About It. Professor Matt Williams, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much.